Wonderful. Well, good morning. It is uh, fabulous to be back in CLM. Look at this baptism tank site. Can't wait. I love baptisms. So, and I've got the joy uh, to be part of that tonight. I'm so looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Martin and Esther and the team again for the wonderful invite and the opportunity uh, to be with you. It's a special day for us. I've got Dawn with me today, and it's also her birthday today. She didn't want me to mention this, but it is her birthday today. So for her birthday, she gets to listen to me preach three times. Come on, we know how to live. Um, and so we're celebrating her birthday today. And also our youngest daughter, Beth Ann, some of you will know, it's her birthday today as well, born uh, on the same day as her mother was born. So uh, amazing, share the same birthday. So it's absolutely fantastic. It's great for us to be sharing this day for you. And over the last few weeks, of course, we have been celebrating and rightly so, the death and resurrection of Jesus. As Christians, there are a couple of big ideas that sit at the very heart of what we believe and who we are. We believe that Jesus came, that he lived a sinless life, that he was fully human and fully God, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended to heaven. And one of the big ideas that we absolutely believe in is that Jesus is coming again. And actually, I think it's a conversation we need to crank up a little bit on. I think we need to talk a little bit more about the return of Jesus. When I was a wee boy growing up in church, it felt like it was the, every other sermon was on the return of Jesus. And I have to say now, and this is no criticism of the church at all, or no criticism of anybody at this stage, um, but, but we talk about it less and less today. And actually, it is as important to us as followers of Jesus to think about his return the second time as we celebrate his first coming, right? So we're celebrating today that he came the first time, and that's why we're alive. But there's also an amazing confession for us that he's coming a second time. And that's something that really should be part of our worship and part of our mission and part of our confession. And that's sort of what I have the joy of sharing with you today. I'm going to speak uh, for a few moments on wisdom from the one who will return. Some, some things that Jesus said to you and me about his return and how that helps us. And we're going to take a reading, if you've got a Bible with you, from Matthew chapter 24. Now, if you're finding that, let me just set a little bit of context for you, which will help us. Matthew 24 and 25 really need to be read together. So that's a wee clue for us if we're studying this passage. Um, when we put the two chapters together, they really make sense. And chapter 24 kicks off with a question. And um, you, you've got these amazing buildings that, that, that are, are sort of out there in, in terms of Jerusalem. You've got this incredible temple, 35-acre temple. And the disciples are in there and they're looking at all of these amazing stones and, and, and talking about how magnificent they are. And Jesus comes out with this incredibly controversial statement right in the middle of the temple. And he says, you see all these incredible stones? Not one will be left on another. It's a bit of a shocking thing. Now remember, the temple was the center of Jewish life. The temple was 35 acres in size. It's a massive, massive thing. And the disciples are perplexed, and they ask the question, well, when's that going to happen? Like, uh, 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 how is this going to happen? And, and they start to ask Jesus about how and when these things will happen. And Jesus begins one of the most amazing and troublesome and glorious and disturbing discourses in the whole of his teaching. And he does two things in Matthew 24. He unpacks ideas of when the temple will be destroyed, and little clues as to watch out for that that's going to happen. And in fact, that does happen in AD 70. Literally, the words of Jesus came to pass when he said, not one stone will be left on another. When the Romans conquered Jerusalem in AD 70, they literally ripped up the foundation stones of the temple so that not one stone was left on another. And they plowed over the site. A catastrophic moment in uh, the, uh, Jewish history and the Jewish world. An incredible moment. And so Jesus is giving clues about this destruction of this great building that they're standing in. But then he goes on to talk about this wider idea that one day he's going to return. And he starts to give 
some teaching about that. And in 24, we really get the teaching. And then in chapter 24, 5, he gives us two fantastic parables that relate to that teaching, which we'll touch on. And then he talks about a judgment story when all the nations of the world will be gathered before him. So if you read 24 and 25 together, it really makes sense. And that sort of sets the context for us. Is that okay? Sorry about that technical introduction, but it really will help us as we think about what Jesus says. So here we go, verse 36. So we're jumping into this discourse of Jesus. And here's what he says. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And then they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the hand mill and one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants of his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he is not aware of it. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sorry about that. Uh, not a very happy ending to our story. But the words of Jesus, nonetheless. Now, for the Christian community, we believe this. This is a, an outstanding um, central idea to our belief system. We believe that Jesus is coming again. And in fact, for the Christian church, since the dawn of the church, it has been one of the most dominant ideas in their conversation, in their belief system, and in their proclamation to the world. It actually dominates the New Testament narrative. Paul describes it beautifully in Titus when he describes the return of the Lord as our blessed hope. I like that. Our blessed hope. That actually, for the Christian, <clears throat> we have a double level of victory. Not only do we get the life of Jesus right here, right now, which we've been singing about and worshiping the Lord and thanking the Lord for the goodness and grace He's given us right now, but we also have this incredible idea that when it, at the end of it all, however it ends and whenever it ends, we have the blessed hope that because of what we have in Jesus, however it ends and whatever it looks like, we will live eternally with him. Now that's good news. I know when you're in the middle of paying your mortgage, it's, it's hard to get your head around that. Or when you're struggling with the cost of living emergency, it's hard to think about that. But that is why we as Christians really need to understand that the return of the Lord is not just a conceptual idea that one day is going to happen in the future, but the return of the Lord becomes a present reality and a blessed hope in how we live our lives today. So when I go to my work, when I go to my world, I'm not just thinking here and now, I'm understanding that everything I do, everything I am, everything I have as a Christian, there is an eternal perspective to my narrative. It's not about my mortgage, though my mortgage is important. It's not just about holding down a job, though that's really important too. It's not just about having a good time or being blessed and prosperous, although all of those things are very, very important. It's about the fact that this moment in history 
is one little moment in an eternal story that we are a part of. And it's the return of Jesus that reminds us we are not just here and now. Come on now, we're not just here and now. That's part of the problem. We get consumed with the here and now completely. And if we're not careful, it sucks us into the here and now in such a way that we cannot see the eternal perspective, the blessed hope. That when cancer comes, we've got a blessed hope. That when the cost of living emergency comes, we've got a blessed hope. That when war comes, we've got a blessed hope. That when famine comes, we've got a blessed hope. That when injustice comes, we've got a blessed hope. There is something above and beyond the here and the now. And most Christians in the 21st century become consumed in the here and the now. And I understand why, because this is where we are right now. But we must not allow ourselves to be so consumed with the moment that we miss the blessed hope. Come on. There is a blessed hope for every single one of us. This idea is so massive, it dominates the New Testament. Completely dominates it. Now, it's, it's probably a shock to us to think about that idea. Of the 260 chapters of the New Testament, the return of Jesus is mentioned 318 times. It is a wow. Because most of us will have no real sense of that and understanding of how important this narrative is to us. In fact, when it comes to the New Testament, every one of the 27 books of the New Testament talk about the return of Jesus, with the exception of Galatians, Philemon, and 2nd and 3rd John. Every other book in the New Testament references the return of Jesus. And the New Testament itself is bookended by this idea. When we open the page, first page of Matthew, what are we told there of this promise of the first coming of Jesus? And how is the first coming of Jesus described? Jesus is described as Emmanuel. What does that mean? Come on, God with us. So the New Testament opens with the promise of a first coming of Jesus, and it's declared that God with us is among us. How does the New Testament end? Let me read it to you. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And then we respond, amen. Come Lord Jesus. Okay, so the, the final words of the New Testament are words that point us forward to something beyond ourselves. And to the fact that not only has Jesus come the first time, which we celebrate, come on, that's amazing, but he's coming a second time, and we should celebrate that idea as much as we celebrated the first coming. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The final words of the New Testament. So if it's such a dominant idea in the New Testament, it should sort of be in our thinking. Now, I'm not saying you have to think about it all the time, but it should be in our, our horizon of our thinking that, that as Christians, when we think about Jesus, we don't just think about him as savior, and we don't just think about him as healer, and we don't just think about him as provider, but we think about him as coming king. He is coming. One day, we were singing about it, one day he will come. One day we will wake up and there will be a trumpet and everything you've ever known and everything you've ever understood will change in the blink of an eye. Everything will change. And that mortgage that you're anxious about, you won't think about for the rest of eternity. Isn't that good news? Come on. Those car payments that you're killing yourself to pay, you won't even think about your car. That's such good news. A whole bunch of stuff that now consumes us. It will all make sense when he returns. That's the blessed hope. Now, here's the problem. What we don't want to do is live so much focused on the blessed hope that we become so heavenly minded that we're no earthly use, right? We don't want to be stargazers and, and weird, right? Living in a parallel universe. So we don't want to do that. But at the same time, we don't want to be so consumed in the here and now that we're taking our eyes off the stars. We're taking our eyes off the fact that there's a blessed hope waiting. The challenge for me and you is to hold these two ideas dynamically together. 
living full on here and now for Jesus with your eyes on the prize. Come on. Come on. <laughs> it is a blessed hope, honestly. <laughs> Come on, are you with me? So, so look at Jesus' words. Jesus says, this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus tells us right at the end of Revelation, I'm coming. But he's already told us that. And from the teaching of Jesus, if, just a bit of a summary for you in Luke 24 before we get to some, some of the meat here. Uh, uh, Jesus, from his, even his casual teaching about his return, tells us three very interesting introductory ideas about his return. Number one, his return will be visible. Chapter 24, verse 30 of, of Matthew says this, At that time, the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all nations will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds in the sky. Now, this was a wee problem for the early church. By the time Paul gets around, there's some rumors uh, speculating going around that Jesus has already returned. And Paul has to remind them sort of of the words of Jesus. And he does this when he writes to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, listen, if he had returned, you'd all know. Because everyone will see him, whether they believe him or not, whether they want him or not. Every human, however that's going to happen, don't ask me to explain the science or the technology, but however it's going to happen, every human will know that Jesus has returned. That's both an exciting idea and slightly scary all at the same time. Do you reckon? I think so. Everyone will see it. Secondly, it's a physical return. Verse 31 of 24 says, He will send His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather the elect from the four winds. Now, again, I don't know how that's all gonna, what that's all going to look like. I don't know the science of that, but here's what I understand. There will be a physical gathering, a physical rounding up of the people of God. And whether they are in the grave or whether they are still alive, they will be rounded up in this most dynamic, supernatural way. So there's something really physical about the return of Jesus. The return of Jesus is not an ethereal or conceptual idea. It's not, well, this is a little picture and a little motif of something that sort of will happen at the end of time. No, no. Jesus will physically return. Physically return. And all humans will see him. Uh, and here's the third thing that Jesus says in terms of his return. His return will be sudden. This is the tricky bit, which we're going to lean into a little bit. His return will be sudden. Verses 40 to 41, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill. One will be taken and the other will be left. Now, we get this idea, and this is where it becomes a bit tricky and a bit difficult for us, that in the return of Jesus, uh, it will be so sudden that not everybody will be ready. And there is this implication, this idea that when he returns, some will be taken and others will be left. Now, we can have a big conversation about what that looks like, but at this point, it's just this idea we've got to accept and we've got to understand that, that one day there's going to be people walking down the park, walking their dogs in the park, and the trumpet will blow and a dog will be left in the park on its own because the owner has Boom, being gathered, called. He's gone. She's gone. And the sausage dog's looking, what's going on here? Why didn't I go? We can have a conversation about that later if you want. Why didn't I go? All right. And there'll be another dog owner going, where did she go? What just happened? And Jesus warns us, and this is a bit wonderful and amazing and glorious and a little bit terrifyingly scary. Jesus warns us, his return will happen so quick, no one will get a chance to get ready. You're either going to be ready or you won't be ready. It's not like, hold on a minute, Lord, I know you're coming, just get, give me two minutes to just get me a fair sort. No, no, no. If they're not sorted out, boom, you're left. If they are sorted out, boom, you go. You glad you came? Okay. What an exciting sermon. Thanks. If only we'd have known. Um, all right. Come on now. So what should our response be to this? And I'm so glad Jesus doesn't just tell us of this amazing event 
but he gives us some really outstanding wisdom. And, and the, the, the one person we really should listen to on his return is the one who's returning, right? I mean, there's been millions of books written on this stuff, and you could literally knock yourself out studying the return of Jesus. It is a massive field of theology and conversation, and I love all of that. But, but having even done all of that stuff and looked at various ologies and various views and various uh, theories on how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen, and what it's all going to look like, I find myself now drawn back to the simplicity of Jesus. <clears throat> And I sort of just think, right, okay, whatever the theories that will eventually unravel and work, the, the teaching of Jesus still stands 21 centuries later, and it still speaks to us. And so we're returning to that. Jesus says, I'm going to return physically, I'm going to return visibly, and I'm going to return suddenly. So, so how do we respond? So he says to us, therefore, therefore, and he starts to give us some advice. And he gives us three pieces of advice which I think really help us in the 21st century. So here they are. The first piece of advice he gives us is this. Watch continuously. <clears throat> Watch continuously. Look at his words. These are the words of Jesus, not the words of the theologian or a preacher. These are Jesus' words. Verse 42. Therefore, in the light of everything we've said, physical, physical, and sudden return, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Now, a couple of things to notice there. That's a command. It's not an option. So as a follower of Jesus, if Jesus speaks to followers of Jesus and says, you really got to do this, then we don't have an option. It's not up for discussion. It's not being, well, it's no, no. He says, keep watch. And he's saying to me and you, however you're living now, whatever your world looks like, one of the mandates on the church is to watch so that we're not caught by surprise. So that when we're seeing things happen, we're going, well, that is terrible, but we sort of got the heads up that this was going to happen. Right? Now, now, that doesn't make us complacent. It shouldn't make us complacent about our environment. It shouldn't make us complacent about our social uh, 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 engagements. It shouldn't make us complacent about justice. It shouldn't make us complacent about mission or, or expansion. These are all things that we can remain absolutely committed to. But what it means is this. When, when we see some stuff that's happening on planet Earth, because we're watching... We're not, can I say this carefully, shocked. We're not perplexed to the point where, oh my goodness, how are we going to get through this? But we understand there's something bigger going on here. It's interesting, in chapter 25, Jesus tells uh, three stories, two parables, and a sort of a judgment story. Very, very challenging stuff. And the three stories sort of relate to his teaching in 24. It's like he drops a piece of wisdom in 24, and then in 25, he gives you a wee story to explain the wisdom. And in chapter 25, he tells this really strange story of the 10 virgins. So 10 young women who are waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. Now, there's a whole cultural context to that, but there's just no time to go into that other than to say this. They were waiting for his arrival, and if they were at a certain point when he arrived, they could join the procession and enter in to the wedding celebrations. If they missed that moment, they could miss the wedding, right? So that's the sort of point. Everyone in Jesus' world would get that, understand that. And so you've got five virgins. Not only have they got their lamps, but they've got extra oil. And then the other five virgins, well, they brought their lamps, not so much oil. And the inevitable happened. They, they ran out, and so they say to the five with oil, give us some of your oil. And they say, hold on a minute. If we give you some of our oil, we might not have enough, and we might miss the bridegroom coming as well. Go and buy some. Go and get some. And while they're away, of course, getting some, the inevitable happens. The bridegroom rocks up, and they miss the moment. And here's what Jesus says. Listen to this. Speaking of the ten virgins, therefore, keep watch. Same idea, exactly the same phrase as he's just used in 24. 
Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, what does that mean to me and you? Keep watch. I mean, stargazing. What does it mean? I, I don't know about you, but I love traveling. And uh, I'm always amazed. Uh, my family will tell you, I'm a control freak traveler. So I'm there really early at the airport. Who's with me? All right, about three or four control. I'm surprised there's not more control freaks in the room. But I'm there really early. I would rather have a cup of coffee in the lounge, chilling, than have, you know, a story of a heart attack on the way to the gate because we were late, all right? So that's my world. And I just love chilling and relaxing, doing a little bit of work, maybe a bit of reading uh, while waiting for my gate to be called. I am ne it never ceases to amaze me the amount of times I've traveled where I've got to the gate and you hear this announcement. Will, Fred, get to gate 39 right now. The plane is about to close its doors. Fred, where are you? We know you've checked in. We know you're out there somewhere. Fred, your plane is about to leave. Now, this could be a holiday. This could be an anniversary trip. This could be going to watch a sporting event. And Fred's in the bar somewhere getting tanked, right? He's just having an amazing time. Got completely distracted by a new friend that he met and completely lost sight of the board. You know, I, I, Dawn bought me a lounge pass program so that when I travel, I can check myself in the lounge. It's, what a, it's a gift that keeps giving. It's a marvelous gift. And, 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 the, and the lounge pass people will always say this to you. Keep looking at the board. No announcements will be made. Some of you are nodding. You've been there and done that, right? And here's what they say to you. While you're enjoying all this lovely dinner we've put on for you and having a little glass of this or a glass of that, listen, keep your eye on the board because we won't announce it. That's what Jesus means. As you're doing your everyday world, keep your eye on the board, right? Don't become obsessed by it. Don't make it the only part of the conversation. Enjoy the food in the lounge. Enjoy meeting a new friend at the airport. Enjoy the experience that you're in, in, enjoying in Birmingham Airport or Manchester Airport. Have a wonderful time. Keep your eye on the board. Keep watching the board because the, 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 the prospect that the, the, the gate will be called is the thing that's going to keep you focused so that you don't get so distracted in your enjoyment that you miss the plane. Are you with me? So we don't want to sit in the lounge going, don't talk to me, don't talk to me. Bored, bored. I'm waiting for the board. I need to download that app that notifies me when the gate's called, okay? And that would be un intolerable. Imagine me sitting with Dawn in the lounge. Dawn, don't talk to me. Bored, bored. Got to focus on the board. Right, we don't want to miss. That would be bonkers, right? But at the same time, it would be irresponsible to ignore the board. Come on now. Can I just say this? Please, please don't be offended. Lots of Christians are having such a great time. It's been a while since we checked the board. Are you with me? I've met Christians and they're having such a good time, they really don't want the gate to be flashed up. Life here is so good. I want to hang around for a while. This is great. Now, now, that's good for you if that's what's going on. But, but that's what Jesus is warning us against. Don't get so consumed in the lounge that you take your eye off the board. Come on now. And that's an important idea for us, not only when we're prospering, but it's an important idea for us when we're suffering. Keep your eye on the board. When you're suffering, keep your eye on. When you're prospering, when you're blessed and, and your cup is overflowing and you're going, this is like wonderful, wonderful. This is amazing. Thank you. Louis Armstrong was right. It's a wonderful world. <laughs> right? When you're prospering, don't get distracted by the prospering. Keep your eye on the board. Because here's, uh, here's the sobering thought. See, when the, when the trumpet sounds, all that prospering you've got, all of it, all of it gets left behind. You won't, you won't be grabbing your murk, okay? It's just, it's gone. 
You won't be grabbing your stuff. You won't be grabbing at your house. When the trumpet blows, suddenly everything will make real sense and all that stuff. So, so listen, you've got to keep your prosperity in perspective. How do you do that? Keep your eye on the board. Keep your eye on the board. Keep your eye on the board. Are you with me? That makes sense? And when you're suffering, keep your eye on the board. COVID, the war in Ukraine, our, our world is literally groaning, groaning environmentally. Uh, the planet is literally, it feels like the planet is rebelling against humans, right? Our world is creaking at the edges. If you've traveled at all, yes, the world is wonderful, and the world is also weirdly, weirdly on the edge. Yeah. Humans today are more sophisticated than they've ever been, and we are more vulnerable than we have ever been in our entire lives. Now, now when prosperity comes, what do you do? Keep your eye on the board. When the persecution comes, when the suffering comes, keep your eye on the board. That actually keeping your eye on the board helps you to keep even your suffering yeah. in perspective. Does that make sense? That's why Jesus says, watch, don't be a stargazer, but don't be irresponsible either. Don't ignore the board. That's really stupid. Don't fixate on the board. That's really boring. But keep your eye on the board because the gate will be called. And if you're not ready, you might miss the plane. And that would be terrible, right? Does that make sense? I don't know if it does or not, but I'll keep going. Here's the second thing. Jesus says, watch, not just watch. But watch continuously. He commands us to watch. Secondly, wait expectantly. Look at this, verse 44. He says, so you all also must be ready. Like that word. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, the idea here of that word is the wait leaning forward. It's sort of wait with expectancy. So you're not just waiting hanging around waiting, but you're waiting with an anticipation. You're waiting with an understanding. Whatever it is I'm doing today, it's with a view to helping me wait for that thing. Are you with me? Does that make sense to you? So it's not just an aimless, sort of hopeless waiting. It is a waiting with anticipation and expectation that helps me to wait in such a way that my everyday life starts to sort of lean towards that waiting. Now, Jesus tells us an amazing parable that helps with this. So he drops this little wisdom in. Chapter 25, he tells us the parable that we sometimes refer to as the parable of the talents. And a master calls his three servants, and he says to one servant, I'm going away for a long time, not quite sure when I'll get back, but I want you to look after some of my portfolio. So he hands over five talents, serious amount of money. This is a serious financial uh, investment into the servant. And he hands over five talents, and he says, take care of that for me while I'm away. Calls another servant, same story, hands over two. And then he calls a third servant, same story, hands over one and then he goes away. And it says this, I love this in verse 19, after a long time, we've been waiting for the return of Jesus for 21 centuries. There's a whole bunch of people think, we've been waiting so long, this thing isn't going to happen. When's it going to happen? 21 centuries is an awful long time for humans. It's a flicker of a screen when it comes to eternity, Right? It's, 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 it is long. It's not long in relative terms. After a long time, the master of those servants returned. And what does he say? And he settled accounts with them. So he called the one who had five, and he called the one who had two, found out that the one who had five had doubled the money. Boom. Come on. Good man. And that the one who had two had done the same. And here's what he says to them in verses 21, 23. Well done, good and faithful servants. Now note that. You have been faithful with a few things. Now, now note that. He commends them for what they did. He's not just commending them for being like ready in the, yeah, one day the master will turn up sense, but he's commending them for, in their faithfulness because their faithfulness was expressed in the way they invested the master's portfolio. 
They expected the master to return, so they worked on his portfolio. Are you with me? And so they're commended not just for being faithful in the sense of, oh, you're still here, but they're commended for being faithful in the sense that you did good work. Does that make sense? Look at what he says to the third servant who had his one talent and ended up burying it in the ground, didn't do anything with it, um, didn't, even, didn't even earn interest on it. It just buried it in the ground. Here's what he says, you wicked, <clears throat> lazy servant. Wow. Why is he wicked? He's wicked because he didn't anticipate the return of the master. Why is he lazy? Because he didn't use what the master gave him. And here's what Jesus said in one of the most troublesome statements that Jesus ever makes. Verse 29. For everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. Ah, wow. Ouch. This is difficult stuff. John, what's going on here? The point is this, that, that Jesus wants his followers to wait expectantly. How do we wait expectantly? We just sit in the room and just wait? No, no. We take whatever he has given us Whatever that is, one, two, five, makes no difference, right? The issue is not what he's given you. The issue is what he's given you, right? So what we mustn't do is compare ourselves to the five, the two, or the one. That's an irrelevant conversation. Don't go there. Jesus isn't even touching on that as an idea. Here's what he's saying. Whatever you have been given, here's one of the ways you're showing that you're believing the master's going to return. You take what the master gives you and you work it. You invest it. You pour yourself into it. You make sure that when the master does return, you can say to him, look at what you give me and look at what I did with that. So that we have something to return to him. Does that make sense to you? I, I told you I'm a control freak, but one of the worst travel experiences I ever had was when we went to Crete on holiday a few years ago, and we were flying out of Heathrow, and, uh, and I was sort of carrying all the documents and, and the passports, and there was me, Dawn, Simeon, and Beth Ann. We were going, everything was set, checked the car in, everything was amazing. Got to the check-in, BA check-in, nice and early, where we're booked into a lounge. It was all going so well. And I got to the a lady who was checking the passports, and she said, let me have your passports. Reached it in my bag, and I could only find three. I had a wee bit of a moment, but I thought, it's in there somewhere. It's got to be in there somewhere. I've never left a passport behind. This doesn't happen to control freak John Andrews. This is, it's in there somewhere. So I said, oh, just hold on a wee minute. Checked everything. And then we had that terrible moment where I can't find it in the bag that it should be in. And then you do this weird stuff, right? I don't know if you've ever done this. You start searching in places where you really know it's not going to be but we'll check it out just in case. So I got Beth Ann to open her case. Well, I knew it couldn't be in there. Dawn opened the case. Simeon opened his case. We were body searching people. You know, it was like, shall I strip search or come on? Let's go. I mean, let's check everything. I was at a point of complete desperation. It has to be somewhere because I always have the passports. Well, long story short, we couldn't find it anywhere. Beth Ann and I, it was her passport. We couldn't get on the flight. Dawn and Simeon went on. We rebooked for the very next flight the next morning, and I had to go home and try and find this passport. And I remember driving home. Poor old Beth Han. She's, we're driving around the M25. She's trying to cheer me up. Dad, when we get back, we'll go out for dinner, and I'll pay. And I said to her, darling, darling, listen, and here's what I need you to do. I need you to be quiet. <laughs> Just don't talk to me. Because I am absolutely beyond myself. And I was, and, I, and she took the hint, and she just, she just, and I'm driving around the M25, and I suddenly realized where it was. Got it. Had the revelation. I said to her, I know where it is. She said, where? I said, it's in the scanner. And the night before we were due to travel, we, Beth Ann and I were going on a trip to Kenya. And, and the Kenya team had emails saying, oh, we need 
We need Beth Ann's passport scanned quickly, emergency sort of thing. We, we can't find our record. So I, I went down to the scanner, scanned the passport, forgot to take it out of the scanner. Oh, it was terrible. We had a lovely dinner that night. <laughs> An iPad. iPad. She didn't pay. iPad. And then the next morning, we got down early and I booked her into the lounge and she loved the lounge experience. All of that was marvelous. We got there eventually and had a wonderful holiday. But I learned what it meant that day. Everyone who has more, who has, more will be given. The one who doesn't have, even what you do have, will be taken away. All right? I lost out that day because I had been negligent with what was entrusted to my care. Because I'd been negligent, we had something, not only that we lost, but something taken from us. Now, as followers of Jesus, what does this mean to us? It means that you and I need to be men and women that are serious about what's being given to us. One of the ways that you declare Jesus is coming again is that you take your gifts seriously. You take your talent seriously. You take your opportunity seriously. You take your place and position of blessing and prosperity seriously. Being, being born in this country, being given the education I have, being given the political and religious freedom I've been given, I regard that as part of my talent portfolio. That's why I've tried to max it out my whole life because there are people all over the world would have loved to have been born where I was born, loved to have had the passport I had, loved to have had the education that I had, loved to have went to the church that I went to, loved to have had one of the million or so Bibles that have gone through in my lifetime. And I'm incredibly blessed. And one of the ways I declare that Jesus is coming again is that I take everything he has given me, everything he's put in my hand, and I max it out for his glory. So that when he returns, more will be given. <laughs> and we won't miss the plane. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask the band to come and join me. I think we're finishing with a, with a song. Is that right, Mark? Marvelous. When you're ready, you can make your way up as I land this now. Land, sorry. Excuse the pun. All right, here we go. Jesus tells us to do what? Watch continuously. He tells us to wait expectantly. He tells us, thirdly, work relentlessly. Look at this, verse 46. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing when he returns. Jesus tells an amazing story right at the end of 25. Scary story. And the scary story is this. He's gathering the nations of the world in front of him. It's a judgment story. We don't like Jesus' judgment story. Very rarely do we talk about Jesus and his judgment stories, but there's quite a few of them in there. And Jesus presents this scenario. He's, he's judging the nations of the world. And we get this sort of picture. He uses a shepherd analogy. Uh, and what happens is uh, he's separating the sheep from the goats. So the sort of righteous people, people that are ready, people that have followed him, they're going to be they're, they're the sheep separated to one side, and then those who haven't followed him or loved him or, or, or uh, accepted him as Lord, they're, they're the goats. They're going to the other side into judgment. And we get this incredible moment. Here's what Jesus says to the sheep as he calls them to eternal glory. He says, for when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I was sick, you looked after me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. And the righteous say to him, Lord, when did we, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and a stranger and naked and sick? And in prison. Here's what Jesus said to them I tell you the truth. Now, when Jesus, the truth, says, I tell you the truth, we really got to listen, right? You've got to zone in. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers of mine, you did for me. And then he does the reverse to the goats. 
He says, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't. And they, go, they, they respond the same way. Jesus, if we'd have seen you naked, we'd have definitely put clothes on you. Like we, you'd have definitely had food at our table. You're Jesus. But he says to them, in the same way that you didn't do this to the least of my brothers, you didn't do it to me. When Jesus ascended back to heaven in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are standing there and the two angels say to the disciples, why are you standing looking up to the sky? They say, this same Jesus will come again. In the same way that you've seen Jesus go, he will come in that same way from heaven. And and that was deliberately to remind them of the word that Jesus had spoken just previously to them. What did Jesus say to them? You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus was getting his, his little community of believers ready for mission, ready to go, ready to launch into the world. So when Jesus then ascends to heaven, the temptation is that we just stand there looking at heaven. But the angels remind them, no, 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 that's not your job to stand here and look at heaven. Jesus is coming again. Remember that. Work towards that. Here's what you need to do. You need to get on with what he told you to do. You need to touch his world and mission his world. And the very next verse in Acts chapter 1 says, verse 12, it says, and they returned to Jerusalem. And then they received the Holy Spirit. And the rest, as they say, is history. Jesus will come again. But listen, one of the ways that we declare that we believe Jesus is coming again is that we go. A going church is a church that believes Jesus is coming again. In fact, in Matthew 24 said, the end will only come when every people group gets to hear the name of Jesus at least once. That's the implication. So actually, a declaration that we are going in mission is a declaration we believe in the return of Jesus. A church that sits back and does nothing, a church that folds its arms and, and enjoys its comfort is a church that's actually saying we don't believe in the return of Jesus. But a church that feeds the hungry, a church that's committed to justice, a church that's committed to mission, a, a, a people that say these are the things that Jesus would do. And when I do them to others, I am doing them to Jesus. That church is not only declaring the goodness and love, loving kindness of Jesus to the world, but it's also declaring to the world, we believe that Jesus is coming again. That's why we're doing these things. That's why we're giving these things. That's why we're going. That's why we're serving because Jesus is coming again. We celebrate his first coming and rightly so but we must celebrate his second. We must make the return of Jesus part of our belief system, part of our conversation, and part of our declaration that because he's coming again, we live with hope. Because he's coming again, we live with purpose. Because he's coming again, we live in mission. Because he's coming again, we commit ourselves to the things that he wants us to do. Jesus says to us, to all of us. I'm coming again very, very soon. So here's what I need you to do. Watch continuously. Keep your eye on the board. When you're looking at the news, remember the board. When you're reading the paper, remember the board. When political leaders are flexing their muscles, remember the board. When the cost of living emergency threatens to overwhelm us, remember the board. Watch continuously, wait expectantly, use what's in your hand for the glory of God and work continuously for Him. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, reach those who are lost because in doing it to them, we do it to Him. Why don't you stand with me? Let me pray for you. Jesus is coming again. What a hope. It gives perspective to our prosperity. It reminds us it's just stuff. And stuff that should be used for the glory of God, not just for our own enjoyment. But it's a, it's a hope that keeps our suffering in perspective. That these light and momentary afflictions are storing up for us. 
Jesus is coming again. Lord, I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters in this room today that a fresh revelation of your return will become part of our belief system and confession. In the midst of the everyday, the routine, the normal, the mundane, the boring, the good, the bad, and the ugly that we all face on a regular moment in our lives, Lord, I pray that the reality that Jesus, you are coming again, will be a blessed hope to us, giving us a perspective of faith and life and allowing us, Lord, to live in a way that says to our world, in what I do, in what I give, in how I respond, in how I serve, in how I go, I'm declaring that Jesus is coming again. Lord, may this church, may the church, may your church be a church that not only looks out, that not only looks in, but a church that looks up in anticipation of our blessed hope.